You know, I just love to come to worship. It is the highlight of my week, and the reason is because we get to be with Jesus singing his praises as a, a group of people. It was so tough during COVID uh, when we were here without, uh, well, when nobody was here but a few of us so we could record the services. It just wasn't the same. It's so much fun being together with Jesus. And you think of all that you have from being a follower of Christ. Not only is there the, the joy of worship, but you have a friend to lean on, a God to listen to your prayers, a Redeemer to save you, and a living Lord to welcome you into eternal life. And of course, there's all of the holidays too. I mean, just think of what they would be without Jesus. I, I can't imagine that Chris, Christmas would be quite as special to me if it was just about a big guy in a red suit. Or Easter, I mean, I like rabbits and chocolate as, as well as the, the next person. But what a blessing it is to be able to celebrate the resurrection and Jesus' victory over sin and death. I can't imagine all the joy that I would have missed out on if I wasn't a follower of Jesus. I mean, even obscure holidays like today, Palm Sunday, are a blessing. Once I asked the confirmation class what their favorite church holiday was, and there were votes for Christmas and a, and a few for Easter, some for Thanksgiving, none for Good Friday, of course. But the number one favorite holiday of these young people at church was Palm Sunday. And can you guess why? It was, as kids, it was the only church holiday where they weren't told to sit still and be quiet. They got to get up and, and dance through the aisles with palm branches, shout Hosanna, make a lot of noise. It was a party, it was a parade, and they loved it. Of all the church holidays, their favorite day to be a follower of Jesus was Palm Sunday. Which is appropriate, I guess, because as Jesus rode into Jerusalem that Sunday, Everybody wanted to be a follower. Everyone wanted to see Jesus. Following Jesus was fun. Remember how it happened? Luke starts uh, the story this way. He says, As Jesus approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And then John tells us about the palm branches. He says, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Hosanna! It was a party parade. Following Jesus is fun. But not always. Sometimes following Jesus also leads us to do things that aren't all fun and games. Sometimes following Jesus leads us to care and caring costs. Look at all the different people in the Holy Week story. There's so many that cared for Jesus. And it seems that, that everyone who cared for Jesus also paid a cost for it. It cost them something. It wasn't always big like the, the owner of that donkey. Just gave up the, the use of a donkey for a day. But it was a cost. Scholars uh, have speculated about how Jesus was able to have that donkey waiting for him. Did, did Jesus sneak off in the night and, and make some special arrangements with a donkey dealer? Or, or did he know the heart of that donkey's owner? A 
heart that cared so much for the Lord that it only took four little words to let strangers walk off with that, with that little donkey. And those words are, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. They heard those words, and they surrendered the donkey. It cost the donkey for the day, but when the Lord needs it, I mean, what can you do? The donkey owner may have been the first one whose caring heart cost him something, but that was just the beginning there that Holy Week. On Thursday, Holy Thursday, Monday Thursday as we call it, Jesus needed a place to, to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. You know, Jesus had said foxes have holes and birds have nests, but, the, but he had no place to lay his head. Didn't have a house to go home to. Didn't have a church building to celebrate in. And so they needed some place to stay and to celebrate the Passover. And someone gave up their room so that Jesus could do that. Here's what Mark says, chapter 14. So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, The teacher asks, Where's the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city and found everything, just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. To care for Jesus, it cost somebody his donkey, cost someone else their upper room, and for still others, it cost them their peace. Because Mark continues, In the evening Jesus arrived with the twelve. As they were at table eating, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. And greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one? This disturbing piece of news upset the disciples. But, but it was nothing compared to the peace that it cost them to see Jesus actually arrested there it's from the Garden of Gethsemane when they saw Jesus betrayed and dragged away. John uh, and Matthew reports it this way. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came to do, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you came out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writing of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. They were now wanted men. Their peace was so disturbed that that it even cost Peter his integrity because remember how he's, he denies even knowing Jesus three times. And the disciples weren't the only one whose peace was upset and who paid a price for caring about Jesus. Mary Magdalene and, and the other women actually supported Jesus in his ministry. They provided food and, and they cared for his needs. And now they had to watch as the one they cared for is crucified. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And you know what happened after that? Jesus dies on a cross for your sins and for mine. 
And after that, a person who cared risks his own life to take care of Jesus' body. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he'd cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. It cost Joseph of Arimathea his own tomb to care for Jesus. Now, now that sounds a little strange to us, but these tombs were not like graves. These were elaborate rooms carved into the rocky hillside, and they were used by a family for generations. When you died, they laid your body out on a stone ledge there inside that tomb, and eventually you'd be nothing but bones. And your family would come back in, they would collect up the bones, they would put them in a box and put them in a little niche in, in the wall there, and you'd be ready for the next person in the family who died. They, they cost a fortune to build, a lot of time, and they were used for generations. But Joseph gave up his own tomb because he cared about Jesus. Joseph also has a friend, had a friend. His name was Nicodemus. And he also cared for Jesus. And it cost him a fortune in spices to embalm the body. John 19 says, He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial custom. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. John has that weird statement there because these were family tombs but Joseph gave up his brand new family tomb for the sake of Jesus and Nicodemus gave up 75 pounds of spices Nicodemus and Joseph and the Marys and the owners of the donkey and the upper room they all cared and it all cost them and it costs us too to care in the devotional book Good Enough Kate Bowler writes of her friend Christy in the UK. Christy is a nurse who had stepped away from the hospital setting to, to teach nursing for a while, but when the COVID pandemic hit, she volunteered to serve on the front lines again because she cared for all those desperately ill patients and for the overworked and overwhelmed doctors and nurses who were trying to save their lives. She worked almost around the clock and in suffocating protective gear, or perhaps with, with too little protective gear, risking her own life. But Chris, Christy was exhausted, but she persevered. She didn't give up. And she explained her efforts to help in this way. The way you know you're doing your job correctly is that it costs you a part of your soul. It costs to care. Caring, she said, is an occupational hazard. And I know some of you here work in caring professions where caring is an occupational hazard. Whether you are a nurse or a doctor, a social worker or a teacher, a nursing home attendant or a counselor, caring comes with the territory. And caring costs. But you don't have to be employed in in a caring profession, to care. In fact, it's an occupational hazard of all Christians because we care. We care. We care for our families. Now, I was just thinking today, so many families are dealing with health issues and it, it, it's almost easier to have your own problem than it is to have somebody that you care about who's going through difficulties. Am I right? And we care about our friends here at church. 
We lift them up in prayer. And we care for our world because it's God's creation. And as Christians, we care for our neighbors because Jesus told us to love them. And we care that they meet Jesus and that they're saved by his grace. We care for people near and far and caring costs. Caring costs our time. Caring costs our energy. It costs our, our comfort. Maybe even a little piece of our soul. And it might also cost our money. Why do you think we're trying to raise tens of thousands of dollars next week on Easter? as we give our Easter Be the Hope mission offering. It's because we care. We care that there are orphans in Africa who can be equipped with a lifetime of employment and self-sufficiency and faith. That they don't have to, to exist on, on begging and, and what little somebody gives them. That they can be empowered through Zoe Empowers. That they can, they can have a life that's so much larger than they can dream of. And we care about folks in our own community that struggle with hunger and, and, and other issues, whether that just be temporary or long-term. Hastings Family Services uh, allows us to respond to those needs to help them get back on their feet. And we care for our youth, like we saw with AP in the, in the video. And I say that our youth, because God has brought these folks into our midst. Now most of the youth, and the 50-some youth that come to, to youth group each week, they, they didn't grow up in this church. Probably not in any church. But God has led them here, and we care. And we care that they discover a relationship with Jesus Christ that will transform their life. And so camp is a, is a big part of that caring and raising money for scholarships so that no one is left behind so all can go to camp and encounter Jesus in that powerful way. Now it costs. It, all those missions cost. And the many other missions that we support. And it costs for all the ministries of the church and the general fund as well. All these things cost. It costs to care. But no one knows that better than God. The cost of God's caring for us was the cross. The death of Jesus Christ so that we could live. As Jesus tells Nicodemus, remember him? The, the guy with the 75 pounds of spices? As Jesus tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It cost God his Son. And it cost Jesus the pain and the humiliation of the cross. Remember the events of that day? They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. They offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him. Above his head they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the, now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. 
In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. The king of heaven humbled himself unto death on a cross because he cares for you and for me. No one paid a greater cost to care than God. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much God cares for you. How much do you care for God? Are you willing to loan him your donkey? Give him your upper room? How about your own tomb or 75 pounds of spices? I suppose you probably don't have any of those things. But what do you have that God needs? Your time? Your love? Your friendship? Your money? Your life? Would you be willing to give them all to Jesus because of four simple words? The Lord needs them. The Lord needs it. Will we care for God and for others? It costs us. Can't help it. Comes with the territory. It's an occupational hazard for those who are followers of Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus. May no cost stand in the way of our caring. May we be willing to follow in your footsteps. Not just as you walk into Jerusalem to cheering crowds and shouts of Hosanna, but may we be willing to walk in your footsteps. Even if it means the crowd is yelling for our death. And a tomb awaits us. Lord, we are so grateful for your care, for your love that is beyond our imagination. We can't, we can't love quite that much. We can't care quite that much. But Lord, help us to try. Help us to try to follow in your footsteps, no matter the cost.